I didn't expect you to read all of that. I thought you'd take out some things. But it is great to be here. My subject this morning, you've noticed, is written for our word learning. It comes from the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 4, where the Apostle Paul writes, For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So I want us to think about written for our learning. The song that's our theme this week, we've been reading or singing, O oh, let the ancient words in part, changing me and changing you. Brethren, I've seen a drastic change in the church over the last 60 years or so that I can remember. I was in church the first Sunday after my birth. The doctor that delivered me was one of our deacons at that congregation in St. Petersburg, and he, he got onto my mother for having me out so soon, and she quickly said, well, where should I take him? I, of course, don't remember that, but I do remember how Bible class always started. Some of you may as well. The first thing the Bible school teacher got up, whether you were in elementary or junior high or high school or the adult Bible class, the first question that was always asked every Sunday morning was what? How many are daily Bible readers? And the number of daily Bible readers, it went up on the board with the attendance. I wonder why we don't do that anymore. We don't do it where I'm at either. I think I know why. I think I know we're not studying the Bible, we're not learning God's Word the way we used to. Growing up, we had Bible study every night at the supper table. You didn't leave the supper table until after the Devo. Dad got home from work. He had a, a, a job that he got off at 4.30. He walked in the door about five minutes till five. Dinner was on the table ready when he walked in. All five of us children had our own place to sit. We would eat first because supper was, was warm. And then you didn't leave the table until that study was over with. And part of that Bible study every night for supper was memorizing passages. We knew God's Word. And if you didn't have your Bible verse memorized, you were in trouble. There were some nights I didn't have mine quite memorized. But I had a very strict father. And I certainly did the next night. And it wasn't a simple verse. Some of the passages that we were required to know, and I'm talking uh, elementary, upper elementary, was the Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We learned God's holy word. I remember obeying the gospel and, 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 and the gospel meetings that we used to have when I grew up. And I, I remember and I believe it was Brother Guy in Woods that told the story about a circuit riding judge. And he would go from town to town holding court. And he told the story that on that judge he got to one town and he couldn't find a Bible. And, and you know, without a Bible, you can't hold a trial because you've got to have the witness put their hand on the Bible and, and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Brother Woods told us, true story, that this judge couldn't find the Bible, so he asked if there was a member of the Church of Christ in town. They found one. Had him come into court, had the witness lay his hand on his head and take that swearing in. 
I've been looking for verification of that story. I've heard others mention it, but I don't know where the citation is for that. I remember, I believe it was Brother Willard Collins years ago in the gospel meeting. Again, I was just a, 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 a small kid, I think maybe 10, 12. And I remember him making the statement that if suddenly every Bible in the United States disappeared, that members of the Church of Christ from memory could rewrite that book. I dare say today that we could do that. I don't think we're doing the Bible studying that we used to be doing. I don't believe we're getting the Bible learning that we used to concentrate on. And brethren, I wonder if that's why the Lord's church is not as strong as it once was. Some of the latest statistics are we're losing 92% of our young people. 92% of the children coming up in the church are not staying in the Lord church. And I wonder if part of it is the fact that we don't know the Bible. They don't know the Bible. We need to get back to that. I want to think of this morning with you for a moment about how teaching has to precede learning. We'll talk about learning in a minute. Let's talk about how we get there. You'll notice from the screen that I think we need more Christians with beautiful feet. And before you start taking your shoes off, (laughs) let me clarify that. For those that haven't already come up with the next verse I want to share. Romans chapter 10 beginning in verse 14. The apostle Paul wrote, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of great joy. We've got a shortage of people today with beautiful feet. We've got a shortage of people that are teaching the word. Let me give you some examples. Let me tell you about my brother. He grew up just like I did, quoted many of the same passages I did growing up. He got married, he moved away from home after going to Christian college. He called me up one day and he said, Larry, we've got a great new preacher. You've got to come down here and hear him. My wife and I, we talked about it. We said, okay, well, what if we come down in two or three weeks? I'd like to meet this guy. We drove down there. We spent a wonderful weekend with my brother. Walked into church that Sunday morning. It was a large congregation. Didn't get a chance to meet the preacher during Bible class or before services. We were led in prayer, and when I opened my eyes from that prayer, the lights were out in the church building. There was somebody standing about halfway down the aisle with a spotlight shined on him. Oh, he could tell a story. I don't think there was a dry eye in the auditorium after that story was told. Something to do with a, with a, a, a handicapped young boy in a, in, a, in a butterfly is all I remember now. And, and he, he led us in prayer, and, and by the time the prayer was over and we opened up our eyes, he was in the pulpit. The lights were back on in the services, and he continued to, to give his sermon. There wasn't one single scriptural reference in that entire sermon. He alluded and partly quoted a passage. And that was it. And and, and you wonder why we don't know the Bible like we used to? With 
within just the last few months, my son and daughter-in-law and the two granddaughters changed congregations in the town that they live in. They didn't really want to leave, but some things were happening, and, and, and they had been there all their lives, the two granddaughters. But they, they, they quickly got into this new youth group, and, and my granddaughter, 16 years old, came to my wife. After three or four weeks, she, she said, Nana, do you know, and mentioned the name of the new youth minister. And Diane said, yeah, well, I don't know him real well, but I've met him and I, I, I know who he is. And, and my granddaughter said, he's wonderful. He's teaching us the Bible. He said, she said, Nana, did you know that there's qualifications for elders and deacons? My wife says, well, of course there are. And she says, well, I never heard it from my other youth minister. Diane said, well, what did you all do in Bible class? She said, we watched movies and we talked about things. Did you ever open the Bible? No, we didn't even take our Bibles to Bible class. And we wonder why we're losing 92% of our young people. When preachers aren't preaching the Word, Youth ministers aren't teaching the word. I've got a brother-in-law that's an elder at the church in Timberlane in Tallahassee. My sister goes to some of the meetings where they're interviewing the congregational interview for the new youth ministers. And she said it's kind of discouraging. Said the parents of the teenagers that are looking for a new youth minister, said all they want to know is, are you going to take our kids to Disney? How many times a week are they going to go to your house? Where are you going to take them, here on this trip or here on this trip? Said nobody ever asked, what's your education? Oh, what curriculum do you want to teach our young people? It's never that. It's always, how are you going to babysit our children? And where are you going to take them to? And we wonder why we're not as strong as we used to be. A few years ago when I got my master's degree, as I've been mentioned, one of our classes had to do with delivery of sermons and we were given 10 minutes to get up and give our sermon. And then the other students in the class were to criticize constructively. And, and I got up and I, I preached a sermon. I, I believe it came from 1 Timothy chapter 6 where Paul talks about flee, follow, and fight to hold on to your salvation. And one of the younger kids in the class, I say kid, he was in his 20s. He was in, you know, working on his master's degree as well. And when it came time for him to critique me, he said, well, you, you, you sound like an old-timey preacher. And I kind of smiled. Yes. And then somebody said, I think it was a professor, said, said what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? He said, oh, you use too much scripture. Well, one or two students later, it was his turn to get up. And there was, again, a 10-minute sermon with almost no scripture in it. And we wonder why the Lord's church is the way it is. When the Ethiopian eunuch went to was going home and Philip joined himself there in Acts chapter 8. You remember the question he asked, Philip did. Do you understand what you're reading? You're reading from the book of Isaiah, do you understand it? And you remember what, what the eunuch said was, was, how can I unless some man guide me? We need those beautiful footed Christians 
that will help guide people in learning the Word of God so that we can have the church as strong as it used to be. When you think about Timothy, all the beautiful passages that Paul wrote to him, Paul said, all Scripture is breathed out by God. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So many in the Lord Church say they don't have that training because they don't know the Scriptures. I've been very disappointed over the years in the questions that I'm asked by long-term church members. You, you expect those that, 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 that we convert, and, and at Bellingrath Road, we've got a lot of new Christians. But the ones that have been in the church all their lives, asking sometimes the simplest of questions, because they don't know the answer. I've been disappointed on many occasions. But that scripture is God breathed. Brother Larry talked about it yesterday, the, the writing of God's holy word. Now, you and I do a lot of writing. I take a lot of notes. I make a lot of shopping lists. But they're for me. God didn't need to write the word for him. He wrote it for us. And unless we're people of the word, we're not going to know how we're to, to teach others. We're not going to know what to teach others. If we're not in the word ourselves, In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus said go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. We know what the gospel is. The gospel is that good news. It's that which comes from God's holy word. That's what we're commanded to proclaim. Here's another passage that we're all familiar with. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Do you know the meaning of all those songs you sing? Do you know what your Ebenezer is? Do you know what the Rose of Sharon is? I wonder how many of our young people, I've only sang the song a couple of times because we don't there at Bellingrath Road, but we, we sang it at Eastern Hills Sunday morning. Beautiful song. Has to do with taking a, 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 an awl and punching your ear into the doorpost. I dare say, very few in the Lord's church today have any idea what that means. And if you don't, don't sing that song until you go to Deuteronomy chapter 15 and you find out what that means. By the way, it means that you're an indentured for life servant. And if we're singing this song to God that he would come and pierce our ear to the doorpost, we're saying I'm going to be a servant of yours for all of my life. But I'm afraid in so many cases, we sing the words. But Paul said they're to teach and admonish one another in the singing of the songs that we sing. If we don't know what we're singing, then how can we teach one another? We simply can't. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. I cannot even read this verse without thinking about a young lady that lived in Mississippi years ago with the congregation I preached for. You know the passage. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The young lady grew up in the church there. 
I mean from birth, her uncles were members there, her aunts were members there, everybody there was just about related to this young lady. Spent all of her life in church went off to one of our Christian colleges, came back, didn't find that husband she was looking for. So she found him there in town. A nice young man. Really enjoyed, had the privilege of performing the, 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 their wedding later on. But she called one day. We'd had a baptism at church that morning and, and her, she and her, her fiancé was there and and she called that afternoon, and she said, we've been to studying, and we've been talking. And Brother Birch, he wants to know, and I can't tell him the answer, why did you baptize that person this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? In the church all of her life, graduate of one of our Christian colleges, and doesn't know what Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 says. Doesn't know why. We baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Brethren, the Lord's church today is hurting for the learning of God's word. So we need to have those teachers. But we've got to go beyond that. We've got to take responsibility for the learning. Because even if teachers put it out there, if you're not willing to learn it, if you're not willing to spend time in it, then you're not going to know it. Let me tell you about Leanne. As mentioned earlier, I've had the pleasure for about 13 years of teaching adjunct faculty at Faulkner University, the Mobile campus. And I've taught all their Bible classes. Life of Christ, Book of Acts, the Pentateuch, the uh, Biblical Ethics, and just on and on. Several different courses. And I was teaching a class, first day of a, of, of a new semester, and I was teaching this time the Life of Christ. Well, you all know that if you're going to study the Life of Christ, you've got to go to four books, Right? You've got to look at Matthew, you've got to go to Mark, you've got to find Luke, and you also have to go to John. And so this class is a three-hour class. Uh, we discussed the first half of the class, the first uh, probably hour and a half, two hours. We, we looked at the syllabus, and then we got into the birth of Christ and, and Him growing up, and, and we were going to get all the way through uh, age 12 uh, that night. And we took a break, and we came back after break, and, and I noticed of my class of 40, there was one chair in the back corner that was empty, and that's not such a big deal because, you know, these are adults for the most part. They're taking night classes, and, and, and they've got obligations, and, and children, and different things, and sometimes people get sick, so I didn't think anything of this young lady that I did not know not being there. The next morning, I, I was in the registrar's office, and this young lady, Leanne, called. And I was only hearing the registrar's side of the conversation. But she was saying things like, well, you have to take this course. It's required to graduate. Sure, you can drop out, but, but you won't be able to graduate if you don't take it. Finally, the registrar, Jeannie Coxwell, said, said, well, let me, Mr. Birch is right here. Let me let you talk to him. And so the registrar aunts handed me the phone, and, and I started talking and found out the young woman's name was Leanne, a little bit about her. And she said, Mr. Birch, I'm the one that left your class last night, and, and, and I, I, I'm not going to do well, and, and, and I just want to drop the class. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, Mr. Birch, you told us to open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. And I searched and searched, but I couldn't find that book. I tried to find Mark and Luke and whatever that other book was you told me to turn to and said I never found them. I was so frustrated that at the break I, I went home. 
She said, Mr. Birch, you know what's so sad? She said, my mother couldn't find him either. She said, Mr. Birch, she said, I've been to church every Sunday for my 21 years of age. We carry where I go our book to church, our Bible to church, but we never open it. And I said, Leanne, I'm so sorry. That's my fault. I said, do you have class tonight? She said, yes, I do. I said, can you come a few minutes early and see me in my office? And she said, yeah, I'll do that. We sat down, and the first thing I did was I showed her the index in her Bible. I showed her the page numbers. We talked a little bit about chapters and verses. And we took slips of paper and I wrote on them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we put them in the Bible where they needed to go. About four years later, I was at graduation. Up the main campus in Montgomery there at the Rotundra. And Leanne saw me after that graduation. She came up, she gave me a big hug. And she said, if you hadn't taken the time, I'd have never got this degree. I don't start a Bible class anymore if there's visitors in the class without saying, get your Bible. Don't forget there's an index in the front. And don't ever be ashamed to look at that index and turn to the right page number. I assumed that a classroom of adults would know where Matthew was. And I made a terrible assumption. But it just shows again the realities of the world in which we live and the need we have to study God's Word. Again, going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16 and 17. All scripture, get it up here for you. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We're only equipped for every good work. When we know God's word. That doesn't mean we've got to memorize it cover to cover. If it did, I'm sorry. I wouldn't make it either. But we have the ability to learn and to know. Jesus went on in John chapter 15 verse 17. To say if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. Our prayers being answered is somewhat related to the word being lived in our lives. And if we don't know it, we can't live it. John chapter 5 verse 39. Talking to the Pharisees. Pharisees are upset with Jesus. Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath day. They're trying to find some reason to put him to death. You remember what he said here? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness of me. You ever stop to really think what that passage says? That passage says, Pharisees, you think you're okay. You've studied just enough scripture. You think it's talking about you and praising you. But guess what, Pharisees? That Bible is condemning you. It's approving. Jesus is saying of me. So you think you have eternal life. Something that I hear constantly in Bible class is I think. We sit in Bible classes and we discuss God's word. And we keep saying, well, I think the Bible says... I think we ought to, I think, 
Where do we get away from quoting passages? Where do we get away from picking up our Bibles and saying, the word says? And then somebody else says, well, I think, you know, it doesn't matter what you think. God could care less what you and I think. He's given us his word. I was with a family a while back. It's maybe a couple of years ago. We were in the hospital. The family member was dying. He was on life support. and The doctors had taken him off life support. There was no hope. I was sitting with the family, not members of the Lord's church, have nothing to do with the Lord's church. One of them looks at another one and says, you reckon he'll go to heaven? And that one says, well, yeah, I guess he will. You know, he, he, he didn't kill anybody. He never spent time in prison. Never committed rape or didn't molest children. Sure, he's going to heaven. I just had to shake my head. It wasn't the right time for me to upset them. Maybe I should have. But that's how ignorant the world is of God's holy word. They think. We've got to get people rid of thinking. In Romans chapter 10 verse 17 we read, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brethren, there is no faith if there's not the hearing of God's word. If we talk about what we think and we talk about, about philosophy and we talk about world events, that's not going to produce faith in God's word. We've got to get back to the word of God. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. The apostle Paul asked the question, but what does it say? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. The word he said is near you, but your mouth or in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith. That we proclaim. We got to get back to proclaiming the word. The word was written for our learning. If we're not learning it, we're not going to produce that faith. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11 and, and, and verse 6 said, But without faith it's what? It's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You're reading the New King James. I'm quoting the King James. Habit from my little childhood. I hope and I pray that maybe through these illustrations I've used, true events, every one of them, that maybe I've sparked some interest in your life to spend more time learning God's holy word. Maybe the greatest thing that you and I can do for the cause of Christ is to go back home to our congregations, find out what our youth ministers are teaching Find out what our grandchildren are being taught. And maybe if we need to encourage them to spend more time in the Word. I pray that you'll do that. God's Word is magnificent. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. It's terrific. It's fantabulous. But it's only going to do us good if we digest it, if we learn it, and then if we have the faith to apply it in our lives. Thank you for your attention.